Everybody stand who has a mother. Go ahead. Well, we got a couple that didn't, but most everybody else did. Okay. All right, please be seated. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's kind of universal, isn't it? Now, um, I didn't ask how many of you had a good mother because that's a matter of opinion, isn't it? Sometimes we get to thinking that that's really the only thing that's important. Uh, we need to recognize that from the very beginning, God created man in his own image. And it says that he created them male and female. And when Adam got Eve, his wife, he called her Eve because she was the mother of all living. She was the beginning of every mother that's in this room. Motherhood is something that is from God's creation. It's the plan God had from the very beginning. We need to recognize that and acknowledge that. And so we have an honor today. We may be cynical and think it was just to make money by uh, flower people and greeting card companies. But the fact is, it's very nice to be able to have a Mother's Day. I have a couple of mothers with me this morning. I have the mother of my children and the mother of my granddaughter here. And thankful for them to be here for that. You have your mother here. I see Justin leaning up against his mother over here. Uh, for one, I see uh, Chrissy ignoring her mother over there. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got all kinds in here, don't we? There are a couple of things I wanted to share with you from the scriptures on mother, though. And starting with, of course, the creation. We have that one there. But Leviticus 19, which, by the way, Leviticus is also in the giving of the law. It actually is giving the Levites regulations of how they should perform their duties. But in the middle of all that, in Leviticus 19, I believe it's verse 3, he says, teach them to revere their mothers. Teach them to revere their mothers. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father. You shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. There's an amazing statement there, I am the Lord your God. He emphasizes that and repeats it over and over and over again. In the giving of the law of Moses, he constantly reminded them, I am the Lord your God. It was a matter of authority. It was a matter of relationship. It was a matter of, I am your father. I am your, actually, by the way, in the Old Testament, it doesn't use the word father of God very much, if at all. However, it was understood because when Jesus called God his father, they thought he was blaspheming because he wouldn't be allowed to do that unless it was true. And they could not conceive of a fleshly man being the son of God. But father is not what he says, but he says, I am the Lord your God. So revere your mother. Honor your mother. In fact, one of the commandments is honor your father and mother. Now, we're not going to talk about fathers. I suspect that the same ones of you that had mothers in here will also have fathers, so we'll just ignore them, at least today. But in looking at mothers, we want to understand this idea of honor your father and your mother. Honor, respect, love, cherish. I don't know, what word do you want to use there in reference to your mother? Respect is definitely one of them, isn't it? How about this? What happens if you don't respect your mother? Leviticus 20, verse 9. Anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to work. I'm, a, I'm sorry. Did I hear you say something else? Put to death. My mother used that on me a lot when I was a kid. I said, Mom, I didn't curse you. No, but you disobeyed me. You disrespected me. Well, yeah. Deuteronomy 27, Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother, and all the people will say, Amen. Deuteronomy 5, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord has commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. That your days may be long. There's a promise built into that, isn't there? In fact, that's reminded later. In Ephesians chapter 5, as the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is talking to the church 
in Ephesus during that first century. He says, here is something important for you to remember. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with promise. We actually have a promise as a result of honoring our father and our mother. Why do we have that promise there? Well, uh, my, uh, the mother of my children, let's call her that, okay, she had an attitude. She says, I brought you into this world. You know the finish of that, don't you? Yeah. She had an attitude. She still has that attitude, by the way. But the idea is there's a promise with mothering, and the children that honor their mothers will have long lives, and they'll live well in the lives that they live. Now, the intention of the promise in the law of Moses was that the children of Israel would remember to honor their God. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we just read, he says, teach these statutes and commandments to your children. Who does that? Fathers. Who else does that? Children. Who else does that? Well, in their society, it would have been the Levites, the priests. Who else would it have been in that community? Well, come to think of it, it would have been everybody else in that village, wouldn't it? But basically, it started at home. It was a home activity. Teach your children these things. Why? So that your children will remain faithful to God, and your, their children's children will remain faithful to God, and keep these commandments and be blessed and honor God accordingly. He says, here's how I want you to do it. Mothers, think back about how you did, taught your children, and then I want you to acknowledge you did this exactly right, okay? I want you to talk about it when you're standing up. I want you to talk about it when you're sitting down. I want you to talk about it when you're walking. I want you to talk about it when you're resting. I want you to talk about it, well, that sounds like everything, doesn't it? Okay, that's not enough. I want you to write it on the doorpost of your house and on the gates entering your yard, too. I want you to put it as a frontlet in front of your eyes. I want you to tie it on your forehead and on your hands. There's some people that took that so literally that they thought they had to have this little leather box with a piece of the scroll of uh, the law of God in it. And you know what sometimes it was? Sometimes it was Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, what we call Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 anyway. Hear, O Israel, our Lord, our God is one. And they'd roll that up and put it in that little box. And they were doing what God told them to do. Because they had tied it to their foreheads, right? That's not what God meant by that. God meant that they do what with it? They keep it before their face at all times. That doesn't mean you walk around like this all the time. It means you walk around like this all the time. You keep it in front of your face. You think about it all. Mothers, did you talk to your children about God's word when you were standing up? When you were sitting down? When you were walking? When you were resting? When you were lying down and when you were rising up? Did you talk to your children about God all the time? Did they get bored with you talking about God to them all the time? That's what he wanted the children of Israel to do. Mothers, take a lesson from the children of Israel and what God wanted them to do so that their generations would continue to recognize and honor and worship God and thus be blessed by God, wouldn't they? Another generational situation like that is one in which in 2 Timothy chapter 1, young preacher Timothy, which by the way, everybody in here kind of knows the family situation with Timothy, right? He was a product of a mixed marriage. One was a Jew the other was a Greek, which means he had both Gentile blood and Jewish blood in him, which, by the way, wasn't legal according to the Jewish law. They weren't supposed to do that. So instead of him being an outcast, though, he became one of the young men that the Holy Spirit chose for Paul to work with. And Paul reminds him, he says, I want you to remember the faith that you received that first recited in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I believe resides in you as well. I want to remind you of the faith that you have because of your grandmother and your mother. Well, you know, fathers, no offense, but 
Uh, if I had a Greek father who didn't know God, I don't think I'd want him to be the one to teach me about God either, would you? But the ones who did know God taught him. Mothers, if your husband's not spiritual, come talk to me afterward. I'm, no, no, that's not what I meant. You be the one who is the person of God in that family. That's what that means. You be the one that reminds them, reads the scripture to them, tells them the stories, prays with them, helps them to understand God in their lives is the most important thing that they can learn from you. And in so doing, can be the mother that God intended for you to be. A couple of concerns. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. My mother used that one on me a lot too. I don't know why she did that so much. Proverbs 6, verse 20, My son, keep your father's commandments, and forsake not your mother's teaching. My goodness, he's repeating himself. He must have had nothing else to say, right? Why is it that there's a warning multiple times to not forsake your mother's teaching? Because children have a tendency to what? Ignore their mother's teaching. Friends, God warns us on that. He says, pay attention, young man, to your mother's teaching. Don't forget it. Don't forsake it. Don't walk away from it. Don't give up on it. She gave you that teaching for a reason. And I know she's ignorant and she's just a woman and I know all the things that are reason why you should not, as a young man, pay attention to what your mother said. But God's not listening. God's not paying attention to that. He doesn't care. He gave you your mother. For better, for worse, for good or bad. And you have to honor that. Honor your father and mother, he says. Because this is a commandment with promise. How about uh, Proverbs 15, verse 20? A wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish man despises his... Can you finish that? His mother. My mother used that one on me too. I don't know why. Proverbs 19, verse 26. He who does violence to his father and chases away his mother is a son who brings shame and reproach. One of the reasons the Proverbs are considered an important thing for young men to, to pay attention to it's probably written to young men, by the way. It's probably counsel given to young men. But it's important that we understand the, the value of what we receive. And then here's one of my favorite. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Now, I think that that really doesn't mean despise simply in the sense of an attitude towards her, but rather don't reject her. You take care of her. You honor her with her livelihood at that point. Why is it a mother instead of the father? Because the fathers had a tendency to die younger, even then. The mothers were often the ones who were left as widows later. And the children, particularly the sons, were asked to take care of them. Do you take care of your mother as much as you can? Bless you if you do. And some of you struggle to do so, I know. But it's a blessing from God to have done so. Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to whom? To his mother. The rod and reproof. Uh, it's illegal to do that anymore, isn't it? Nod your head, yes. It's, the United States of America won't allow us to spank our children, right? Well, we can't use rods on them. Uh, well, I guess a switch would be close, wouldn't it? Okay. By the way, there is no legal requirement that says you cannot discipline your child. Now, I would be careful about doing certain kinds of discipline. And maybe something that was acceptable 150 years ago is not acceptable now. I'll acknowledge that. But you're a mother. The reproof of your child is part of your job, isn't it? And that child will learn as a result of being corrected, of being punished, dare I say it that way. Bad behavior in life is punished, isn't it? Bad behavior in life is something, though it's too late. We teach them while they're young. Train up a child in the way that he should go and he will not depart from it when he grows old, right? By the way, that probably is referring as much to a way of life like in a career or a job, but it's applied everywhere in a reasonable fashion. 
You train them when they're young. Fix them when they're young enough to be fixed is kind of the way we probably should look at that. Another one in Proverbs, Proverbs 30, verse 17. This is the promise. The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. Mom never used that one on me, but I think it's just because she missed it. There's a promise, isn't it? You want your eyes pecked out by the birds? Then scorn your mother's teaching. Children, pay attention. God takes it seriously. Your mothers are the ones you need to honor and respect. And that's not giving them a card or a flower, which, by the way, when we get through this morning, all of you ladies, make sure you get a flower as you go out. But it's not those things. It's not taking them out to lunch today, which, by the way, the restaurants are all going to be full, so don't go to any of the restaurants I'm planning on going to. <laughs> that's not what it's about. It's talking about giving respect to what she is, to who she is, to what she teaches, and learning and then taking care of her in every way that she possibly needs, whatever that may be. I wish I could give you some more information that would help, but one of the things that uh, I was impressed with was Jesus in his ministry. He's got crowds crowding around him. His mother and his brothers come to him. And I kind of got the impression that the way the scripture puts it is they're coming to rescue him from himself. I mean, after all, he's, he's kind of crazy, isn't he? And uh, they get to the place where he is, and the crowd is so full and so pressed in about him, they can't get close to him. So they finally get someone to go in and give him the message. And the message is, your mother and your brothers are here. Now... You want to emulate Jesus, and I, I tried this on my mom once, it didn't work, but do what Jesus did here. And he says, what? These are my mother and brothers and sisters. Disrespectful son, right? Isn't that what that is? So I say, yeah, so I say. What he said was, he who does the will of my father who is in heaven is my mother, my brother, and my sisters. He who obeys the will of my Father who is in heaven. He who listens to me is my family. Now, by the way, he was in his 30s at this point. Is he a child anymore? No, he's an adult, isn't he? He's not disrespecting his mother with this. He's expressing a truth that goes beyond the physical family. And that is of the family of God, the family of the Son of God, Jesus himself, in which he's expressing that these people that hear my word are the children of the Father. They are my mother, they are my brothers and my sisters. And it's a beautiful expression of how you and I are the family of Jesus as well. Think of it in those terms for a moment. Now, I'm not going to say that we go through in the Bible and we find all these beautiful examples of godly women throughout the Scriptures. In fact, you know what's most amazing to me is the fact that a lot of what we see in the Scripture is about the, the ungodly women, the ungodly mothers. Uh, we don't want to use them as an example, though. Rachel, who got her son to lie to his father to, in order to receive the blessing. Now, Rachel, that's not very nice. Esau didn't think it was very nice at all, did he? So we have the blessing going to Jacob instead of to Esau. We don't want to do that, though, do we? We don't want to bring up those kind of examples. We might want to bring up the example of Deborah, who the Scripture says became the mother of Israel. But, you know, the reason she became the mother of all Israel is because none of the men were strong enough to stand up and be the person of God they were supposed to be at that point as well. And so it's kind of a backhanded compliment to Deborah and we don't really want to hold her up as being an example of what we want our daughters to grow up to be. But the fact is, women of the Bible, yes, we have some beautiful examples of women in the Bible. Esther, for example. We have an example, for example, of uh, Elizabeth and Mary, cousins, who were the ones that the Holy Spirit came to. One was the mother of John, who became John the Baptist, the prophet of God in the time just before Christ. And then Jesus' mother, Mary, and the Son of God is born to her. 
But we have an example in Proverbs 31, I believe it is, the last chapter in Proverbs anyway, of a godly woman. And on the front cover of your bulletin, we have actually a partial quote from that. Her children will rise up and call her blessed. They will rise up and call her blessed. Mothers, do your children rise up and call you blessed? By the way, don't beat them over the head with this and say that they've got to do that because that's not what the purpose of that statement is in Proverbs. But it's an amazing thing, isn't it? And you know what? The longer I live, the more I think my mother was blessed. She was a blessing to me for sure. The longer I live, the more I respect what she said to me and what she did to me, even when she tried to remind me of scriptures about being stoned to death outside the city because you were disrespectful to your mama. Even when, well, no, I won't go into any more. Mothers, God put you here for a reason. You're not just a necessary evil. You're not just a physical peg in a hole just waiting there, hopefully holding down a spot. You actually are an important part of God's plan. And it's not just the physical be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. It is to be the mother of the children that God gives you and in doing so, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Honor your father and your mothers. Friends, we have godly mothers in our lives. We don't always recognize them. We don't always give them the honor that is due. But we need to recognize that mothers are so important that even Jesus on the cross he is in agony, he is in pain, can hardly breathe, much less speak. And he sees John the Apostle standing right over there and kneeling down in front of him is his mother Mary. What does he do? He ignores them and dies. Is that what he does? Nobody knows the answer except Robert. Okay, a few of you know the answer to that. He says, mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. That's a little obtuse. Couldn't he have been more explicit, a little bit clearer? John, take care of my mother. That's not what he said. But that's what he meant, wasn't it? From that point on, John took Mary into his home as his mother. She was just the physical birth mother and family mother of Jesus. She wasn't important at all, really, was she? Yeah, she was important to him. He loved his mother and honored his mother, even on the cross. Friends, we honor our mothers today. We love you. We are thankful to God for you most of all. But we appreciate the fact that you've given your all. And I remember something my dad said after my mom died. She says, she did the best she could. She did the best she knew how. And the older I get, the more I understand that. Because in my perfection as the father in my household, and always doing the right thing, never making a mistake, I've been a little judgmental of others. And, you know, if you've been that way too, maybe we need to repent and turn ourselves back to God and recognize that all we can ask is to do the best we can. If your mother did the best she could, then honor her. If you honor her for no other reason than because God says you should, then honor her. But if most of us, like most of us anyway do, who love our mothers and appreciate what we did receive, then honor her in that as well. Let's have a short prayer before we have an invitation song. Dear God, we thank you for blessing us with this life that you've given us. Thank you for giving us mothers and fathers. At this time, Lord, we want to especially thank you for the mothers in our lives and that the life that you gave her and then giving her our lives that she might help mold and shape us was a God-given responsibility, a duty, but also a precious task that she fulfilled as best she could. We pray that we will always be thankful and always be respectful and appreciative of what you've given us in our mothers. And Lord, at this time, we ask your blessings upon all these mothers in this congregation here especially, but in all of our lives, Lord, we praise your name and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. As is our custom, we offer an invitation. That's for repentance. 
but it's also for coming to Jesus. And if you haven't come to Jesus yet, now is a good time to do it. Come to Jesus, repent of your sins, confess his name, be buried in waters of baptism for the remission of your sins. But if you have need of that, won't you come now while we stand and sing?